afternoon. Welcome to the Bermuda Business Development Agency's second Bermuda Angle webinar. My name is Stuart Roberts. I'm the Director of Communications and PR at the Bermuda Business Development Agency. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Stephen Weinstein, the chair of the BDA. Stephen Good afternoon. Here. Welcome to the Bermuda Angle webinar series. In this episode, Bermuda, the world climate risk capital. In today's session, we will discuss how Bermuda is building on our strength in natural catastrophe reinsurance, for which we are the world leader, our globally respected financial services regulatory regime, world-class human capital and established infrastructure to seek to become the jurisdiction of choice to help our clients and the communities they serve mitigate risks related to climate change. We're extremely pleased to have you here today for this important topic, and I'm thrilled to moderate our outstanding panel. Let me introduce them to you. Sarah Demerling is a partner at Walker's Bermuda, leading their investment funds practice and is co-lead of the reinsurance and ILS practice. She specializes in funds and investment services, insurance-linked securities, regulatory compliance, including fintech and mergers and acquisitions. Sarah is also the chair of AIMA Bermuda and heads up the ILS market intelligence work stream of ILS Bermuda. John Huff is president and CEO of ABIR, the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurance Companies. In his current role, John directs ABIR's worldwide public policy initiatives and leads the organization. John has more than 25 years of experience in the insurance sector, most recently as the 2016 president of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the U.S. Standard Setting and Regulatory Support Organization, created and governed by U.S. state insurance regulators. And as director of the Missouri Department of Insurance, a position he held for a full term of eight years. John has substantial experience in climate driven natural catastrophe response. And indeed, John, I think that is how you and I met. And finally, last but not least, Ralph Kersdorfer is Deputy Director in the Insurance Supervisory Department at the Bermuda Monetary Authority, our unified consolidated regulator, and is responsible together with his team for the supervision of a portfolio of globally active PNC reinsurance groups and firms. Ralph is also the leader of the BMA's Environmental, Social and Governance Task Force, ESG, and represents the BNA in the Sustainable Insurance Forum. No topic is more important to businesses, investors, and executives than managing and mitigating climate risk. Let's get right to it. John, we have asserted, and I've just done so, that Bermuda is well-placed to be the world's climate risk finance capital. What supports that claim in your view? Well, Steve, thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting the webinar, and thank you for your leadership at the BDA. Uh, it's without question that climate risk is Bermuda's foundational expertise. Uh, undisputed that the Bermuda market continues to be the leader in natural catastrophe risk transfer and has been for some 30 years. Uh, Bermuda market now represents about a third of the global property and casualty reinsurance market. It really all started back in the, in the early 90s, if you would, right after Hurricane Andrew hit Florida. And uh, established markets in, in that region determined that Florida environment was just too volatile. And the, by environment, they meant not only the weather, uh, but politically. And then uh, the Bermuda market really came to life then and helping on the reinsurance side, helping those small seeding companies build in Florida st to start taking that risk. Uh, Bermuda's been leaning into climate risk, changing weather patterns ever since uh, the early 90s. And there's probably more climate expertise, human capital uh, in Bermuda than anywhere in the world, and uh, not even taking into account the 21 square miles here in Bermuda. This is really where that uh, foundational expertise shines. Uh, and if you think about the, 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 the skill sets that are required, whether that be in modeling or analytics, new product development, uh, certainly pricing and forecasting, but also um, uh, management of climate risk by uh, aggregation tools that the industry work uh, uh, works in building and working so closely with the Bermuda Monetary Authority. And if you think about how foundational it is also to uh, pool the risk in Bermuda uh, from all of the different uh, climate events, whether that be California wildfires, Florida hurricanes, uh, Japanese typhoons, or, or European flood risk, uh, the, the pooling of those risks and the capital efficiency that's necessary uh, to manage those risks uh, is just a, a highlight of what takes place uh, in Bermuda. The, the recent data released by the Bermuda Monetary Authority tells the story uh, in and of itself. Um, uh, brand new data for the last five years in the U.S. alone, 
Bermuda markets paid uh, in excess of 208 billion in the last five years since 97. Uh, in excess of 410 billion paid to American consumers and the seating companies that uh, represent them at the insurance level. Uh, some of the highlights there, uh, uh, about 2.7 billion for winter storm URI for Texans, uh, uh, which was a, a significant event earlier this year. And the California wildfires from 2017 to 2019, uh, a tremendous uh, set of claims for the Bermuda market in excess of 9.3 billion. Uh, likewise, in the UK and the e EU, um, uh, the last five years has represented about 65 billion in, in claim payments. Um, and just, I, I, I would be remiss without just saying one word about where investors now understand uh, this, this climate risk expertise in Bermuda. We've had an influx of new capital in the insurance and reinsurance space, about 18 billion in the last 24 months or so. Uh, we're calling it Bermuda Startups and Scale Ups. So we're seeing some new companies with some seasoned uh, veteran executives that we worked with previously, but also scaling up uh, some of our legacy firms, ABR members uh, that are in the marketplace and investors uh, are, are uh, leaning in and appreciating that climate expert, uh, expertise. So Bermuda is, is uh, talent in the space is really second to none globally. And, and that's why I think it's going to be such a, a good issue for our industry, uh, not only for insurance and reinsurance, but climate uh, finance generally. John, thank you. That's a, a great intro to this topic and uh, a lot of data. Those numbers are really eye popping in respect to Bermuda's contributions to the communities that we're serving worldwide. You know, and as you, you teed up, John, institutional investors are recognizing and deploying capital to Bermuda to adopt these risks. Sarah, institutional investors are also increasingly integrating climate risks into their own considerations as they uh, work through their investment process. What role could ESG compliant investments like ILS play in this drive of Bermuda to become the world's climate risk capital that John has, has just teed up for us? Thank you, Steve. And thank you, John. You've, you've covered um, nicely some of the um, intros that I, I wanted to touch on as well. So I think it's important to know ILS is already recognized by the United Nations as a sustainable development um, investment class. Sustainable investment, as we all know, is very, an important area of focus for institutional investors, ultra high net worth and family offices. And in fact, in January of this year, Larry Fink, who's BlackRock CEO, famously said that climate transition to net zero emissions presents a historic investment opportunity. So a lot of investors are looking to get into this space. I think Bermuda is exploring additional risks and opportunities that we can provide investors with sustainable returns. Obviously, to, we're looking to increase the ILS market capacity, but also we want to ensure that we support a framework that gives investors comfort and confidence that this is indeed ESG compliant. Um, for the audience, very quickly, that are not familiar with ILS, it's insurance linked securities. Effectively, it's a financial instrument, either a share or a bond, typically sold by an insurance company by special purpose vehicle to sophisticated institutional investors. The reason that it's had so much traction is it offers portfolio diversification. So it's a natural hedge to the financial markets and it's triggered by a property catastrophe situation. So as John alluded to, for instance, a hurricane or wildfire, um, irrespective of what happens to the traditional stock market. We use the term ILS to talk about catastrophe bonds, the cap bonds, collateralized insurance, ILS funds, which is very close to my heart, sidecars and other forms of risk-linked securitization. Um, as we've heard, Bermuda is a leader in the ILS market. And just to give you some more statistics, uh, last year, we had a record-breaking 16.4 billion for annual cap bond and ILS issuances. And the BSX, as of Q2 of this year, had 40 billion market capital outstanding, which represents 95%. So when we say that we're the leader and we've been doing this for years, we, we really do have the, the numbers to back it up. So turning to the investors, um, a crucial factor in their investment decision-making is understanding what is the minimum required rate of return, what is the cost of capital. And when estimating the cost of capital and climate change mitigation, it's inherently difficult. And I think that's where the Bermuda can offer some value. Again, as John mentioned, the modeling, the analytics, that's very fundamental to this space. 
um, and investors can rely on that in part to um, take advantage of that experience for scenario planning, which is increasingly becoming uh, being applied to climate change adaptation. Then investors can reallocate resources according to risks based on managers benchmarking pricing doing the modeling. We're seeing investors integrating climate change risk and impact assessment into their investment decisions more and more. And for us and for today's topic that um, presents many opportunities. They're looking to access or asset, access new markets that meet their ESG strategy framework and that have ESG characteristics. Again, that's where ILS and Bermuda has a unique opportunity. We've got a long and rich history as a financial center both on the asset management side and on the reinsurance side. And I think that makes us very unique. We've already shown that we're a global leader in the natural catastrophe space. We also have institutional quality asset management infrastructure. Um, institutional investors are familiar with Bermuda. They've done their due diligence. They have a significant confidence in Bermuda uh, and they know that it's a tried and tested center of excellence. So I think when we talk about becoming the world's climate risk finance capital. For me, it's not just the reinsurance sector, it's the whole life cycle. So um, it's structuring, establishment, establishing the investment vehicles. I really do think it's a, a fantastic opportunity and a great time for thoughtful dialogue with everybody, seedants, sponsors, managers, end investors, and ultimately obviously the BMA to achieve desired global results. Um, it's a time to listen and collaborate and find new solutions. And that is what Bermuda does best. And it's what we're known for and, and uh, we, we genuinely excel at it. A couple more points. I think Bermuda leads the way in all things related to ILS. We really are the heart of um, convergence. I know we've now converged, but the insurance industry and the capital markets coming together. Um, we've connected investors and business opportunities for years. Now I think it's time to take what we've learned use it as a blueprint and progress into the next natural wave of ILS growth, which is capital efficient, climate related, risk transfer and financing. Key to that evolution is gonna be bringing more original risk to the market, but inevitably it's also gonna involve regulation. And our job with Ralph and his team um, is to consider what is the best practice approach that Bermuda is gonna to take to make sure that reputational risk is protected we, we need consistency. We need standards that facilitate growth. They, they shouldn't be too burdensome. And I don't think we should have increased reporting for the sake of reporting. I recognize that we need accurate and meaningful data to track and monitor ESG performance levels. But I think now is really the opportunity to help shape what do we mean by sustainable financing? What is green? What is good? What is clean? Um, and create a unified ILS ESG framework. Obviously, we're not in reinventing the wheel. A lot of good work has been done by the Paris Agreement, by the United Nations, by Europe. But I think what we can do and what investors want is transparency. And finally, Bermuda's always had a sensible, pragmatic, risk-based approach to regulation. I think now we've got the opportunity to apply that for the greater good. Back to you, Steve. Thank you, Sarah. And indeed, that is a perfect segue to our, <laughs> our, our next panelist. Um, uh, we've heard from the private side, what we uh, both the traditional and the traditionally called the non-traditional. We're off with that that very handy transition to you. Can you share with us what has been to date the DMA's roadmap for climate risk? What do you see as the milestones ahead? Uh, th thanks a lot, Steve, first for being here, and, and thanks for the other panelists about the ideas about regulation. I, I give you a little bit an outline what what was our journey from the BMA side uh, and the background where we, where we come from. So I guess a general remark, I guess what we have to recognize is that climate risk is a, is a, is a transversal risk on the one side. It means it manifests itself through a different uh, existing risks in, in the financial industry already. So we're talking about investments, about underwriting, uh, reputational risk, uh, uh, and opportunities on the other side as well. As well. So, but on the other side, it's as well a risk in its own rights, and uh, and therefore that created for us 2019 uh, the need 
uh, for a more holistic approach. Uh, uh, and and we, we found our ESG group, which was mentioned at, at the beginning. Yeah, we call it now as well as subject matter expert group. Uh, there they are in, internal experts, and we have actors on board, supervisors, uh, uh, and, and as well, we have some links to external uh, stakeholders uh, built up, service providers, uh, big fours, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the two tar the tar basic targets of that uh, ESG subject matter expert uh, team is twofold, I would say. Number one, exactly what what Sarah mentioned, to to to, to see where our framework needs perhaps uh, further development. We think it's quite well fit. It's a risk-based framework, but but where do we need perhaps particular sustainability or climate risk relevant uh, aspects in our framework and we need to adjust it. The second one is uh, this team as well is, has an open ear and, and eye for the market uh, with respect to uh, yeah, licensing and supervision of innovative business models. So for example, Sandbox in, uh, uh, initiative. So, uh, is as well an expert team on that side. So it's it's basically both. Yeah? Uh, our first actions with this um, task force have been we we have joined the Sust Sustainable Insurance Forum. That are like the, I would say the world twenty leaders. Now there are thirty, but but at, at that time it was like fifteen to twenty leaders on the regulatory side worldwide. Uh, and 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 that team or that that group of regulators basically pushes. The topic climate risk in the regular landscape. So that was one of our first uh, uh, actions which, which which we made, uh, together with uh, strengthening our our collaboration with with NISC on that front as well with Steopa on the other side with, with a bunch of other regulators. So that was uh, one of the first actions. The second one, and you find this on on, on our page on the BMA page, we 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 actually made a comprehensive qualitative climate survey. For the insurance sector, for the whole commercial sector, it's uh, it's it's really life and and PNC and everything uh, along uh, the whole value chain. I get what, what Sarah mentioned before because it's important to to consider the whole value chain. Underwriting is one part, investment is another, governance is another, risk management, disclosure, and the outcome was where the Bermuda market is obviously good. And John mentioned that at, at the beginning or excellent is is everything which has to do with physical climate risk. Uh, topics. There we are totally uh, top notch, uh, I would say. Uh, what is well was good to see that it's not only a risk, it's as well an opportunity, uh, seen as an opportunity. Uh, and that as well was, was, was like outstanding at that moment. And uh, on the other side, we saw as well that it's not only anymore just a, a topic for, for, for modelers per se, it's really getting broader. It's getting broader towards yeah to the senior executive boards and and so on as well good on the other side there are some challenges uh, the challenges are coming from mainly from this long-term climate change risk uh, and and the short-term business planning horizon so that's sometimes difficult to 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 bridge in a way with respect to, to, to scenario analysis for example financial impacts and so on so that's that's one point another point is a lack of standardization. It was mentioned, um, uh, I guess, before as well. Disclosure on climate risk. I guess it's something where, where standards have not yet developed to a totally common standard, and where sometimes uh, companies, not only in Bermuda but in the whole world, are struggling. So that was the outcome. So, so we took it from there, and now we decided, okay, let's let's take a, a closer look at the one side, uh, and there we rolled out now a kind of trial run. Uh, for our companies to see, uh, I call it exposure analysis, to see where are the exposures of climate risk on the one side. On the asset side, do you invest in coal companies, uh, in, 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 uh, yeah, in oil, uh, in green investments? Uh, and then on the other side as well, we ask the companies to run a few, a few scenarios on, uh, on the underwriting side, uh, like, like Basically, to see how, how losses would develop in a in a very warm environment, let's say like that, so 15, 20 years later. So that is going to be for us a, 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 another important exercise, just to see where are the tools. We believe they are quite out there, and as well to see some some impact analysis. Yeah. So for for the year 2022, then our uh, focus would be to give a, a small a small outlook uh, would be uh, we're going to give. Uh, a kind of guidance to the companies where we think as a regulator the companies should work on 
Uh, and, and that's via the, our insurance code of conduct, where it's going to be sustainability as one, 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 one key part. And on the other side as well, a guidance, a little bit more practical around risk management. What do we expect from boards in that context? Which responsibility we expect from boards? Um, and then as well, we would definitely take up the topic climate related disclosure, uh, despite the issues which are still developing standards. But I guess it's a, it's a topic which is, which is, which is indeed very, very important. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we're going to have definitely an open eye and ear for, for innovation, innovative solutions, uh, which, which will come to us uh, either via traditional channels uh, or via, via other channels, right? So we have, the, we have the framework for it. Steve, you're on mute. Ralph, thank you for uh, that, that great set of introductory remarks. It's not it's not a webinar unless someone talks on mute. So I'm I'm glad I've contributed that to uh, to this panel. Uh, and I was saying for our virtual visitors, if you haven't uh, visited or been there recently, I would encourage you to go to the BMA's website, where Ralph, you and your colleagues post a, a real trove of materials, ranging from the uh, analytics that you're doing, Bermuda's claims paying data, and the types of regulatory frameworks that you're building up. Your last set of remarks were starting to touch upon innovation. Uh, you know, as Sarah mentioned, Bermuda is where ILS was invented, where convergence was invented. If we go back farther, where the capital structure was invented. I wonder if we could ask you to tease out a little bit more about your sandbox initiatives and how you as a regulator are balancing this drive towards innovation and maintaining our commitments to participation in the global markets in a responsible way. Right, right. Uh, before, as a I personally think uh, the priorities with respect to, to, to the topic, let's say innovation, I guess first has to be the foundation, which is already existing, but I think it's very important that the companies continue to develop the governance uh, around, around the topic, bringing board members, what they're already doing, but continue to bring board members on, on, uh, on, on, on board. Uh, which which no wide range of uh, with respect to climate risk. So that is that is very a very important base. And with respect to innovation, I think a, a significant part of innovation comes from from uh, let's say the so-called traditional part. That's that, so what we called before the physical risk. Bermuda is is is, is world market leader <laughs> on that topic. So closing protection gaps uh, and and continue to mobilize uh, the finance uh, climate finance in that sense as well. So uh, I, I would say that part of innovation is important to, to be in the forefront of, of product developments, parametric insurance, all of that different examples which are. On the other side, I think innovation comes as well, uh, and Sarah touched on that, on, on what does the insurance industry contribute to the transition to a low carbon world? And there, I, I think we, the, or we think that, the, the, that one of the, the possibilities is uh, to, to just extend the client base as well. New lines of business, uh, new clients, new coverages, just think on the topics, renewable energy, uh, scaling up carbon capture, all of that topic. So that's, that's, that's a part of innovation. Now, if outside that part, there are other ideas uh, on, on innovation, I guess, and there I, I come back to, to the second part of, of your point, Steve. I guess we have, we have a very... Uh, uh, stage framework in, in, in place in, in the BMA. So we have, um, I will not go into detail, it would just take too long, but uh, we have basically as a starting point, the innovation hub. Yeah, that's not, that's not a license. That's more, I would say, an organized uh, exchange with the authority on, on an innovative idea, right? Uh, so if that is then, if it comes more mature, you can as a next step go to the sandbox. So the, the sandbox basically allows company to test new technologies and, 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 and offer innovative products. And it's, it's in a controlled environment and for a limited period of time. And there, I guess, uh, climate related underwriting and all of that new ideas, perhaps, which don't fit in a classical license can, can, can start. And that can grow then in, in, into a, either a traditional license or, or in, a, in, a, in the innovative, uh, innovative class uh, license as well, which we have, have on board already. So there's a whole stage of, uh, of different possibilities uh, for, for, for new business coming. We have traditional, let's say, channels, but as well, we are the in, in, in innovations, innovative channel side, which then can mature over time. Yeah. 
Rob, that's a lot of data. And I, I do have a follow-on question, but let me see if our fellow panelists, both of whom have been involved in Bermuda's innovation, want to add or, or question anything to, to that important topic. Steve, I would just highlight uh, the BMA's uh, strong track record of speed to market. So um, BMA has worked for decades and and allowing industry to come in and talk about new product development or 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 uh, new capital efficiencies. Uh, but both of those categories and others are ones that the Bermuda uh, uh, Monetary Authority is very responsive to. I always say the BMA n may not give you the exact answer you want. They may uh, have an issue with something you're proposing, but the, the beauty of working with the BMA is the timely responsiveness of the BMA. They, they would identify issues and, and work with companies um, to um, uh, to get on a path to move moving forward, and it's it's quite unique actually globally to to ha have a regulator that can be so responsive to industry, um, and, and then uh, particularly in a timely fashion. Thanks, John. That is a really important point, and it aligns with my own experience with the BMA. What once in a while it's speed to not market, uh, but the key is you have an answer, and I hope our viewers uh, appreciate. As I said, it's a unified, consolidated regulator. And for the types of innovation that you all have been noting, well, when you're out there in the blue water, some of the solutions that our market might bring to bear, is it insurance? Is it derivatives? Is it guarantees? Are they banking products? Are they consumer credit? In the United States, you'll have a federal regulator for each of those. And uh, you, you'll, you'll be at the door of the BMA and the types of frameworks that Roth has already described for us. There's just one door to knock on. And that is a, a huge boost to the speed in getting pragmatic answers back to an entrepreneur or a capital allocator. Ralph, one thing else you touched upon was regulatory standards in disclosure. Sarah touched upon it as well in that balance between the challenges market participants are having with the diversity of requests. John spent years herding the cats of 53 state and territorial regulators. Uh, we all read in the media about the number of models and standard setters and ratings firms that want market participants to provide information how far along on the, are we on the journey to some form of reasonably robust consistency? What more can be done and what can the Bermuda market do to accelerate the process? So the question was for me, right? Yeah, I, I, I personally think, I guess, when you speak about standardization in, in, with respect to climate risk, I guess it's gonna come as standardization. Right, so it's it's at, at the moment it's just there are certain parts which I mentioned before, like climate scenario analysis and disclosure, which is a very important uh, important topic for the for the vast majority of the uh, of the of the market. I guess it's it's uh, it, it's still ongoing. Though it's gonna come from the regulatory side for sure. A certain kind of uh, I say not uniform, but a certain kind of similar similar uh, target picture is gonna come. From, from the main markets. I personally think that the companies should, uh, here in Bermuda, should just prepare for it. Uh, I, I, I think with respect to what I mentioned before, uh, uh, already experts on board, uh, bring perhaps some more experts with different kind of, of uh, uh, watch on, on, on climate risk. We have a lot of underwriting climate risk, but we need as well, uh, obviously, investment. The investment part is important. Uh, the board members uh, develop your, your scenario analysis uh, further, right? We, we have all the basis for, 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 for that already uh, compared now to other markets, but, but now it's, it's more a question about long-term scenarios and how it reflects in, in short, short run. So all of that are topics, and as well with respect to climate-related disclosure. I listened still like two years ago, if everybody said it's, it's no common standard and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's difficult, but it's, I guess there has to be a start somewhere. So there has to be a start, and then it's up to us as well as a as a regulators to have reasonable expectations when it starts. We cannot go from zero to one hundred percent right at the beginning, right? Where I see the problem at the currently is, is a quantification of certain risks. I see not so much problems to qualitatively name it. I see more in in, in the, the problem. I see more in the quantification. If you have target pictures, how you measure this, measure the, the targets, how you, how you achieve. So that's, that's something which is still under development. But I guess I would recommend the market to start with it, to start to think about it. And it's, it's I guess the market is already doing that, knows this already. And if I can jump in, Steve, I think the one thing we do well, we can tailor it at this point. 
And if you're asking, you know, the point of disclosure is for the person receiving it. So if we're having that conversation with the end investor as to what they need, then I think it can be a very um, neat solution. And the fact that, you know, there is consultation, there is collaboration, the regulator is open to listening to see what market we have and, and where we want to take it. So um, I think it's a great opportunity. I concur. Sarah, let's stay with you for a sec because we've shared a lot of data and to some degree anecdotes about the success Bermuda is having in uh, companies and investors targeting Bermuda or talking to Rolf about their plans. When you talk to parties about Bermuda, what do you stress to the extent we haven't covered so far as to why someone ought to choose Bermuda to innovate in this space? Uh, there are so many reasons <laughs> I could fill a webinar with them. I think, you know, um, the reputation that we have the respected legal environment, the regulatory environment, the um, we've, we adhere to international standards. We've proved that having the um, FAFAF review and coming out very strongly uh, in relation to anti money laundering, anti terrorist financing. We've got a very flexible regime and legislation, particularly on the fund side. So, depending on if you've got a fund of one, a single sovereign institutional investor wanting their own products, or if you've got private equity, if you've got hedge funds, we cater for all of those. It's not onerous, it's practical. Um, because we have one regulator, you can set up a fund and the underlying FPI um, at the same time, have the same, same conversations. Talking about innovation, we've got, for instance, the um, incorporated segregated accounts company, the IFAC. So it's like your traditional SAC with ring fencing assets and liabilities. But in addition, each account has its separate legal personality. And what that means is within one vehicle, you could have an ILS fund investing into the special purpose vehicle. So again, more efficiencies, more innovation. I think um, we've got a lot of asset managers on island physically. You know, we have a thriving insurance community, ILS community. Um, so that talent is there, which is driving ideas and innovation. Um, and, you know, we're, we're an hour and a half from New York. If you're going to come in to do due diligence on your investors, um, look to have mind and management here, then it makes sense that you would be setting up the structure and the vehicle here at the same time. So I think, you know, the list goes on, but, but there's um, a number of very positive, credible reasons why the media should be um, the first choice. Steve, I, I would add to that. I, I sometimes describe it as stability and agility. So sometimes we have to remind folks that are not as familiar with Bermuda of our certainly our stability at the uh, English common law, but the uh, the recognition uh, by the world, whether it be Solvency II equivalents uh, for our insurance sector or, or uh, uh, U.S. the new highest level of, of uh, recognition, the uh, reciprocal jurisdiction status. Uh, so certainly we have that uh, stability, but then the, the the icing on the cake, if you will, our plus is our agility. So our ability to be innovative and responsive. Uh, and I guess in the in the climate risk finance space, um, you're not hearing here are here are the four products that you should be consider uh, you should consider investing in in Bermuda. What what I think the storyline you're hearing from from this panel is that this is the environment for you to come create your storyline and you come create the products and the innovation and uh, Bermuda is just the incubator that will will help you succeed. I think that's right, John. You know, another element of stability as it relates to this topic is four centuries of environmental conservation and stewardship. Mm -hmm. uh, the Western world's first environmental statute was written in Bermuda in the first couple of years of the 17th century. And uh, the island is as beautiful as it is because of four centuries of a consistent approach to having that as a key value. Another way to tell what you value is what structures you build. You know, and John, your organization has the traditional structures of a, of a insurance sector trade group. And now you have a climate committee, um, which tells you how seriously your members take the issue. And I, I would suspect that they see both opportunities as well as risks. I wonder if you could share with us a bit more of how your community sees the risks and the opportunities and what you think that community might plan to focus on in the coming year. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. So we have uh, traditionally had our policy committee at, at ABIR, which is our workhorse committee, and the climate issue and climate risk issues have been so voluminous 
uh, over the last year or so. And it's really a recognition um, uh, of uh, regulators and supervisors around the world of, of coming live to some of the climate issues that we've been dealing with uh, in our uh, portfolios for decades here in Bermuda. So in response to many of these consultations, we did form um, our climate uh, committee at ABIR. Uh, Jeff Manson is chairing that committee from Renaissance Re. He's doing a fantastic job. And, and we're really looking at this, um, this global conversation about climate, whether it be on the asset side of the balance sheet or the liability side of the, of the balance sheet and all the issues that are being raised by supervisors and, and uh, rating agencies and, and other stakeholders. I, I will take a moment and just say we're, we're, we're fine tuning some of the contributions that, that the reinsurance sector can make on the climate protection gap. That, that tremendous gap between economic losses after a natural catastrophe, where the frequency and, uh, and severity increasing because of climate, and then the insured uh, uh, portion of those losses. And that gap, unfortunately, is growing instead of shrinking. And we are doing a webinar on, um, on October 5th that uh, Jeff Manson is, is moderating. We also have some very special guests. We have the president um, of the NAIC, uh, Florida Insurance Commissioner David Altmeyer, along with the president-elect, uh, Idaho uh, Director of Insurance Dean Cameron, uh, will be joining along with uh, uh, the BMA's uh, Gerald Kukundi, uh, will be and uh, ABEAR's Suzanne Williams-Charles will be joining that webinar to talk about uh, the uh, ability for global international uh, reinsurance and how uh, more diversity uh, of uh, reinsurance could help close that protection gap. It should be a great discussion and um, the details are on our website. We'd be pleased to join people, have people join us. John, thank you for that kind of invitation. That is a all-star roster for that event. And uh, I certainly would encourage people to, to explore that. Rolf, it's interesting to see, it's always fun to hear when uh, your peers in the global uh, uh, regulatory sector are visiting Bermuda in person. They're frequently with us in spirit. I wonder if you can comment on how the collaboration amongst blue chip world regulators like the BMA is playing out. Um, because people care about climate, people can also be territorial about it. What do you see as the roadmap for collaboration as we evolve towards an all hands on deck approach to try to mitigate these risks? I, th I, th I think that roadmap with respect to the, the collaboration with, with respect to climate change has already started quite a time ago with actually that, that dimension sustainable insurance forum where we where we formed part in uh, uh, end of 2019. So that, that that group basically drives certain kind of policy development around the topics which I mentioned before, disclosures, climate risk analysis, uh, so on, so on. So that, there we are, we are part. So that that's the next step now is uh, the IRS, uh, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, as you know, uh, our, our yeah, the most important worldwide organization for insurance supervisors, is um, it has now a, a climate hub uh, structure, a, a climate expert team structure that's brand new out of the press. <laughs> so, so, uh, 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 and, and we will as well form part of that as, as a DNA. So, and that. That kind of, of body will definitely work on on on, on the topics and, and uh, with respect to standard setting, uh, with respect to supervisory activities, regulatory activities, and and then uh, to streamline it in, in a way, try to streamline it as much as possible and uh, uh, through, through through the world, right? So that 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 is a little bit the agenda where we are from, and I guess there is already a certain way. There is a certain understanding about importance of of certain blocks. Uh, disclosure, for example, climate scenarios, and, and then there are perhaps other areas where still has to be a certain discussion around that because regulator, regul, regulatory bodies in the world have a little bit of different mandate from each other sometimes. Uh, so so I, I think that is more or less the roadmap, uh, which I would outline. John and Sarah, as consumers, as it were, of the, uh, the global regulatory approach, I wonder if I can invite any comments or reactions from you or on behalf of uh, the communities you represent? Um, I, I think it, it's a well-balanced approach. I think it's very clear. Um, I think we pull from international regulations. We adhere to international regulations, but we also have a Bermuda 
mantra to it, which again is, it is pragmatic, it is commercial. I think it's sensible. Um, I don't think we're adding anything to processes unless it's needed. And obviously we're evolving. So, you know, as international regulatory standards, whatever that might be, if it's combating money laundering, if it's climate risk, we're making sure that we're considering it and adhering to it. So I, from my perspective, I think it is well perceived and, and there's a lot of consultation. So before changes are made, we have the opportunity as stakeholders, as committees to consider what that is and to have a sensible conversation with the regulator, recognizing that they've got a role to play as well and they're there to you know, protect the jurisdiction, but it, but it is a very collaborative um, process. I would I would build on that. You know, our members do um, operate and do business in about 150 countries. And so it's so important that that our Bermuda market be recognized in those countries uh, for the risk transfer products that they offer. And the BMA really adds to that conversation when, when they've already sat down at international um, international uh, standard setters and, and made contributions to whatever the uh, the, the discussion is is being had on um, uh, related to uh, kind of this this cooperation and collaboration and and uh, working together and ha making sure the standards are compatible. Um, if you think about uh, just the the recognitions that I that I stated earlier, how does uh, being a reciprocal jurisdiction in the U.S. How do we make sure that there's no conflicting um, guidance in and how that works with solvency two equivalents and now with uh, at post brexit how does it, uh, how do we work with the PR, uh, pra which is such a significant market the uk being such a significant market for our members so there is quite a bit of collaboration that's required and the bma not only participates in those they're actually leaders in many of those work streams and so it's, it's so critically important for our industry yeah. And it's easier to sell the jurisdiction when there's that global recognition. We're not just saying it, it's proven from outside as well, right? Mm -hmm. Let's stay on that for a bit, Sarah, the theme of selling Bermuda as a jurisdiction. Uh, we've talked, you know, ranging from regulatory to underwriting to investment technicalities in this call. Bermuda has also made as a country and as a community some very substantial commitments in respect of ESG, particularly climate, uh, to uh, uh, reduce emissions in a significant way over time to restore our endemic environment, including with flood and storm resistant and endemic vegetation. Uh, the human capital of Bermuda is so committed to climate, the uh, DEI characteristics of Bermuda and our commitments in there. From your conversations with stakeholders from outside the country, how important is that ESG branding? Are we doing enough to communicate our commitments and vision? What can we do better and, and how, how should we think about valuing those initiatives? I think we can always do better. I think this initiative obviously is very timely. Um, it's been very well received. Um, I think it, you, you get a good sense, don't you, on LinkedIn as what, what is the um, theme of the day and definitely climate and ESG is, is everywhere. So I don't think we're coming to it late. As you say, historically, we've it's been endemic in Bermuda because we are on the hurricane belt. We're very familiar with um, protecting the environment and, and rebuilding internally with the community. But, you know, I think that conversation needs to continue. I don't think you can, it's one and done. It, it is a, an ongoing um, discussion and dialogue. And I think it, it, it's very important that we're, we're having that now. John, in your earlier comments, the, uh, uh, the unavoidable uh, uh, key events of the year, the wildfires, Hurricane Ida, the, the flooding, the other climate-driven events have occurred. Um, what can Bermuda do to ensure that our partners and uh, uh, collaborators around the world understand Bermuda's contributions to building back and building back better? Well, certainly they're um, uh, getting the word out on the uh, the claims paid is so important, and it's not to to pat ourselves or our, our partners on the back for how much they paid for certain events, but it shows the commitment to those communities in terms of capital deployment. Um, so, if you think about some of the challenges in California that are, are now pretty publicly uh, discussed, it will be: Will there be enough capacity in that market to keep insurance affordable and accessible? And so, I think Bermuda has really stepped 
uh, forward to show their commitment to those markets and how, when they combine um, non-correlated risk of how they can contribute to that market and and, uh, make sure that they're contributing to the insurance sector there. Um, We've seen it be successful in, in states like Florida, um, uh, 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 Texas, Louisiana, and Georgia, um, uh, you know, where you're working with public and private sector, whether there be a, a wind pool or some other sort of risk pool. Um, and um, uh, so there are a lot of ways to contribute. And a uh, part of that is making a commitment to those communities. Thank you, John. Part of that commitment is to keep the promises that we make uh, and have made in the past, as I think all of us have touched upon. And uh, my understanding is that the default rate of the Bermuda ILS and insurance and reinsurance market in respect of third parties is zero, not low, not approximately zero, but literally zero. As we innovate Rolf into new areas, the, the blue waters of the, of the value chain, how is the BMA thinking about oversight uh, in that it's got to be tied for first, our unsurpassed claims paying record in light of the other responsibilities you have on your, on your plate? Yeah, definitely. I guess, I guess, I guess Bermuda. We mentioned it before. I guess the history is like 30, 40 years long, and and overall the history there has virtually no no the default on claims. That that's clear. I guess when I when I started back in in Munich 20 years ago, I guess uh, in Munich Re at that time, I guess uh, I listened to the word Bermuda before I listened to the word reinsurance. So that was, that was all, so <laughs> I, I understood what re, reinsurance is. So so uh, I guess already there it was it was 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 very very well recognized. But I guess in Sen that the, the framework has, has, has even even matured, and we we try to be always top notch and have achieved this as well. And 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 John has mentioned that before. I guess. The solvency to equivalence assessment, very extensive uh, assessment uh, on on the other side as well as uh, the reciprocal status with, uh, with the United States. So so all of that shows how robust the framework is. And then on the other side, the statistics speaks for themselves. I guess it was a 280 billion claims uh, mentioned before, paid in the last five years, uh, and 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 as well, uh, not 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 a diversified way yeah it's 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 around 50 percent goes to the us but let's not forget 22 percent to europe another in the 20s i guess uh, to to asia and other other places so it's it's really uh yeah it's it's really it's really outstanding in in that in that way and what we definitely have to do to keep our framework risk-based uh up to date uh technology based um uh, and and as well develop it where it makes sense Right as well, the regulatory framework uh, has to has to be developed where it makes sense to develop it in one or the other way. We don't need to make every fashion which is coming out, but we we we, we need to develop it where it makes sense. I guess it's it's we start from a quite a very very good uh, base. Rolf, thank you for that. You know, John used a, a great turn of phrase earlier: the combination of stability and agility. And uh, I think something that's been so valuable for the market is how the regulatory framework has evolved over time to meet that full so- solvency to full equivalence to re- uh, merit as we do reciprocal jurisdiction status. The, what we have today are the innovations in overseeing risk adjusted capital adequacy. It's, 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 it's evolved considerably from the regime that we had in place, which was fit for purpose for the time in the early 90s. Uh, not to ask anyone to foreshadow, but as we think about the tools that regulators, rating agencies, and clients will want to see, what types of disclosures and frameworks might we evolve towards as we confront these accelerating risks in respect of the climate? Everything digital. <laughs> um, I don't know. Can, I, can I just say the, the one thing as well that's great? Um, we, we've talked a lot about solvency too on the commercial side but we do have a bifurcated system. So on the ILS side, you don't have to have as high regulatory capital and that's facilitated the collateralized structures and, and what have you. So it, it, it's, it's that, it's recognizing that we sometimes face the States, we sometimes face Europe, very different appetites, very different requirements, but we can facilitate that in one piece of legislation. Um, so I think it, it's continuing to do that, to be cognizant of, um, what's there and how we can achieve it but you know i'm sure that uh i'm, I'm being flippant but i'm sure that you know it the digitization of everything is going to have a have a play or a fintech in, in some degree 
No, I, I take your answer, everything digital, not as flip, but entirely accurate. Uh, I think that's exactly right. Bermuda has always been the best place in the world to match risk and capital and the digitization of distribution uh, really suits our existing competitive advantages so significantly. And when you marry that with the human capital and the sector that John represents and the sectors that Rolf and his colleagues oversee, uh, our opportunities seem both wide and robust as we help our partners and collaborators worldwide confront these challenges. Uh, and I think many of us have touched upon it will take an all hands fits approach and there are opportunities across a range of verticals. And as FinTech evolves in Bermuda, which is a marvelous place to pursue strategy in that space, the ecosystem grows and the possibility for cross pollination across sectors to combine new digital solutions with the underwriting and risk management expertise for which Bermuda is renowned, strike us at the BMA, at BDA as real significant opportunities in the years ahead. Steve, I would also offer just a, as an example of some of the uh, Bermuda leadership in this space. Um, the Bermuda market's very engaged with the Insurance Development Forum, which is the public-private partnership between the insurance industry, the World Bank, and United Nations, and doing some tremendous work. Um, let me uh, give a tip of the hat to Ian uh, Brannigan, who's um, who's co-chairing that um, modeling work stream for the Insurance Development Forum, and the significant work they're doing on an open source modeling uh, work stream, uh, really to make an investment in, in modeling for risk, but also making that modeling available to country leaders in emerging markets, which could be so significant for their development. So it's not just, um, the industry is not uh, just in this business to uh, create more market share, to create more insurance market. They're also doing some sub substantial things with our, with our public partners, uh, like the Insurance Development Forum. And I think that's so important, right? We're, we're extolling the virtues of what Bermuda has to offer, but it's on a global stage trying to facilitate global responses and we can really have an impact on that. And I think that's just phenomenal. But, you know, um, the products that we're talking about and the risk finance, if we get it right and you get the right minds and the innovation, that it actually can be meaningful, it can be impactful for, for climate risk. And I think that is the great uh, uh, and perfect segue to ask you all now, if you if you don't mind, and we'll have time for question on other change as well. But perhaps I could just invite you to offer a closing comment in respect of our uh, prioritization of climate and the opportunities we've seen, or any other related theme you'd like to share with our audience. And uh, to go alphabetically, Sarah, maybe perhaps I'll ask you to uh, to kick us off. Um, I think we've covered a lot. Uh, the one thing maybe is to say that, you know, opportunity and sustainability, they're not exclusive. They, you can achieve both, um, notwithstanding, you know, the longer time horizon. And I think that's what we're um, looking at at the moment and trying to capture. John? Well, I, I would just uh, end where I started. It's such a foundational expertise, uh, climate risk and management of the climate. Uh, in terms of natural catastrophe, and it's it's such a strong base for us to build upon this climate risk finance initiative. So, looking forward to participating in that and uh, and 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 bringing others along. So, thanks for the opportunity, Steve. Thank you, John. You're off. Thank you. That I guess for me is important, even if I say it the third time. Solid solid governance uh, in the companies uh, leads to leads to claims payments, <laughs> which we have shown an excellent track record. And then coming to the business, I guess I see definitely the, the protection gap, as John addressed it a few times, I guess I guess all around physical risk, climate adoption and, and mitigation, where Bermuda has already an outstanding position and has to build on that. And the second thing uh, is, is, is definitely the investor side or, or as well the topic uh, transitional uh, risk, meaning the whole world is moving to a low carbon environment and what kind of contribution can make the insurance industry to that uh, with respect to uh, coverages, new, new, new lines, and as well investing in, in, in innovative business models on, on, on the investment side. So I guess that's, that, that is would be my not so short um, uh, 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 closing comment. Just perfect. Um, from the dawn of our market in, with Hurricane Andrew, which was a climate-driven related uh, significant event, uh, to where we are today, Bermuda has succeeded with 
energy and leadership, like the leadership and energy we've seen from my panels today, but also with collaboration and partnerships, uh, like the ones I know that we'll have with the attendees on this, on this webinar. Thank you for attending. Thank you for joining the uh, Bermuda Angle series. Stay tuned for more episodes in our series. Visit the BMA virtually, and please make plans to visit Bermuda in the real world. Uh, we're safe, clean, and close and managing all our risks. You'll see our the results of four centuries of environmental stewardship, and, and we'll collaborate together. We look forward to welcoming you in person soon. Thanks again for joining us virtually today.